thriving textile industry that we have here in the Lehigh Valley, late 19th century through the mid 20th century. The textile business owners were the largest employer of women in the area. And the industry was one of the most dominant regionally as well as internationally. As part of our Women's History Month programming, we present the history that speaks for itself. Lehigh Valley textile and needle trade business stories through the lens of women with Muhlenberg professor Gail Eisenberg. From 2011 until 2018, Gail Eisenberg and Susan Clemens from the Muhlenberg History Department conducted interviews with dozens of owners and family members. The businesses they examined included cut and slow clothing contracting, textile manufacturing, knitting mills, wholesale operations, textile waste, slipcover manufacturing, and pocketbook manufacturing. Many of these stories consisted of previously untold immigrant narratives. Gail is a recently retired <coughs> professor from the business program at Muhlenberg College, where she taught business and economics courses for over 38 years and directed the internship program for the department. Her focus in marketing research, interviewing <coughs> techniques, and statistical analysis lent itself well to the study of the Lehigh Valley needle trade and textile industry. Today, you will hear stories of the owners and their families told by the people who lived it in their own words. <coughs> a recipient of the Alumni Association Tricorn Award and the Julian Newhart Faculty Prize at Muhlenberg, we are thrilled to have Gail here to guide us through her research on the textile and needle trades of the Lehigh Valley. So please join me in welcoming Gail Eisenberg. And um, welcome everyone. I'm really delighted to have you here with us today. And what I'm going to be doing today, as we said, is tell you about oral histories that I collected of the Lehigh, Fa Lehigh Valley families who once owned textile factories. So a lot of times there have been studies done on the workers. This is one specifically on the owners of, the, um, uh, of these businesses. And as was said, from 1930 to 1980, it was a very prominent industry in the Lehigh Valley. Many of you may have family members um, that were involved in these businesses in some way, as, as whether they were as workers or as, um, you know, as owners, because there were many of these small businesses around. And in keeping with the theme of Women's History Month, today I'm not gonna be focusing on the businesses, I'm really going to be focusing on the women that my colleague and I had the honor of interviewing. This is my husband, also my technology. <laughs> So let me give you a little bit of a timeline of our project. Um, in, in 2011, so you can see I've been working on this a long time. Um, in 2011, um, my colleague Susan Clemens, and she's a history professor, and my students were together at a student conference at Muhlenberg College, and we were assigned in the same room. And at that session, her students were making a presentation on oral histories that they had conducted with people, with members of the Union Baptist Church. And when I heard that, something clicked. And I knew there was this other important local history story that had never been told. And I also, in hearing it, knew that oral history was the right modality, was the right methodology to use to collect these stories. So after you know the session, I talked with her about this idea, 
and asked her if she would partner with me. And she very eagerly said yes, and that's what really started this. And then for the next eight or nine years, we began collecting these stories. <clears throat> now, we always knew we were racing the clock because these businesses were finished in the 1980s, typically. And this was already 2011. So many of the major families or many of the major businesses, the people had already deceased, um, others had left town, but there was still enough that we began to um, do this collection. And we really took people as we identified them and ordered them from oldest to youngest so that we could make the priority um, collecting it from those who were particularly, you know, particularly elderly. So again, we always knew we were racing the clock. Over time, over those eight years, we conducted about 40 oral histories from about 30 different families. And, um, and from our research, we created three major talks. Um, one was earlier on some of our initial findings, but the two later talks, the technology had improved enough that we were able to really incorporate a lot of these embedded videos right from the actual interviews. And we did one on, we called it the American Dream Story, and that's really on the businesses. And the other was on the women, and that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. Um, then from, since 2019, then I worked with the archivist at uh, Muhlenberg's library to create now a public digital archive of all of this. And in that archive, we have all of the original presentations. Um, we have a transcript for each one, chapter listings, an introduction and description of each of the interviews. We have um, these presentations. And last year, I even um, got, a, I hired a former Muhlenberg student who does professional narrations to narrate it, and that's what you're gonna to get to hear today. So, so as opposed to my voice, it's really this nice professional voice. And the goals of the project were always to collect the stories, preserve the stories, and tell the stories. And again, because of our um, racing the clock, obviously our emphasis was on collecting. So we spent the first years really collecting the stories, then the last couple years um, working with the archivist, we now have it where they are preserved, and we're trying to tell the stories. They're able to be told just by having people go to the site, and I'm gonna show you that site later this morning, but also at events such as this. Okay, as an opportunity to tell the stories. And just a few major takeaways from our project. First of all, these businesses were truly quintessential American dream stories. Most of the businesses were started by immigrants or children of immigrants who worked very hard and frankly moved their families into the very solid middle class. Secondly, um, even even though at this point the businesses had long ceased, we were really able to get a very good breadth of different kinds of businesses that we got to interview. Um, a, a lot were what they call um, contractors or cut and sew shops. Those were the ones that were just producing, having the sewing, you know, doing the sewing of the uh, outfits. Manufacturers, wholesalers, um, whenever you have production going on, there's always a lot of waste. So we spoke with um, people who were in the waste, textile waste business, because that was the one of the early recycling. They were able to take the waste and sell it to others because the waste goes into making paper. And actually all of the currency, all of the US dollars and things of that came out of this kind of um, waste business. The knitting mills, they're the ones that actually make the fabrics. <clears throat> And then we were able to speak to most of the made clothes, but we spoke to one major business right here in Bethlehem that made slip covers, one that made pocketbooks, one that made belts. So we were really able to have a good breath. 
and the ultimate um, downfall or, or when this whole industry got decimated was due to free trade and globalization. Uh, free trade and globalization has a lot of positive impacts on society, but it also has negative impacts on certain parts of society. And it certainly was for this industry. Because once companies had easy access to cheap labor abroad, it pretty much left this area and went abroad. Um, and so most clothes that we wear today, they're made in Southeast Asia. Similarly, back in the 1930s, the reason it came to the Lehigh Valley was that in New York, where it had been, the labor was much more expensive. And so companies came to Pennsylvania, where there was a more of an abundance of non-unionized female labor. <clears throat> um, so the breadth of businesses. And then the last thing in terms of the takeaway is the women's stories. And this a little bit surprised us. As we were doing the oral histories, it became clear the women were so interesting and the stories that we heard from them were just so rich and so valuable that we knew we wanted to put together a talk about the women's lives. And that's what you're going to be doing today. And then I just want to real quickly before we do that, I just want to thank um, one, the, the donors. There were different families that helped um, provide some funds for us to be doing this research for over a long period of time. Very much the interview subjects, that everybody was so gracious with sharing their stories and their time with us. Um, also, this took a lot of expertise in a lot of different places on campus. Um, besides my colleague Susan Clemens and myself, um, people in IT helped us a lot. Um, we used a lot of students from media and communications to help me with a lot of the video editing. The library, as I talked about in terms of the archivist. And so there were really a lot of different departments on the campus that helped. And then lastly, I have to thank my husband because through this all, whenever I have any technology issues, my husband always helps me as well as he helped me with a lot of the editing and reading over things and things of that nature. You're gonna hear, and it goes through it, is various women. There's about seven, 15 to 20 women. You'll hear about two minutes from each of their interviews. Okay, the through the 1960s. From the 1930s through the 1980s, the Lehigh Valley and other areas of Eastern Pennsylvania were dotted with textile and needle trade factories. Many of the factories originated in the New York area, but as that labor became unionized and more expensive, the factories moved to Pennsylvania. Often, the manufacturers or sales offices remained in New York City, but the production migrated to Pennsylvania to lower costs. These types of businesses are labor intensive and often employ many women. The Lehigh Valley at the time had an abundant supply of non-unionized, cheaper female labor. During its peak, the textiles and needle trade industry was the largest employer of women in the Lehigh Valley. The goal of this project was to gather and preserve this slice of local history and to tell the stories. To accomplish this, about 45 oral histories with 30 families who owned the businesses were conducted. From these oral histories, there are many different stories. The most expected stories are about the businesses and the men who ran the businesses, but there are many other stories here are stories about the women who were interviewed. Generally, they were the wives of the men who owned the factories. Oral history is a subdiscipline of history that preserves the past from the voices of those who lived it. It is gathered from a specific population and analyzed from the composite of voices to gain a deeper understanding of that history. In this case, Oral histories were conducted with local families who owned cut and sew clothing factories, small textile manufacturing businesses, scrap textile businesses, knitting mills, slipcover manufacturers, 
wholesalers, and pocketbook makers. From that composite, we're able to better understand this local industry. Further, oral history methodology values and preserves the voices of a diverse array of groups on a wide variety of topics. These oral histories widen and deepen local history by adding new voices and groups to existing local history. Now, historians who focus on women, the Jewish community, or the Greater Lehigh Valley will have access to additional rich information about textile businesses and the families who owned these businesses. The women's stories were examined through four lenses wives and mothers, community leaders, women with careers, and women as entrepreneurs. Many women spanned multiple groups, even though they are talked about here in only one group. This is an illuminating picture of women who came of age from around World War II through the mid-1960s. After World War II through the mid-1960s, the culture of the United States promoted the ideal of women giving up their jobs to breadwinners, going back into the home, and valuing motherhood and family on the new home front. Of course, the women in this group had many other interests. The women featured in the wives and mothers category are Roz Mishkin, B. Culler, Shirley Berman, Tama Fogelman, and Beverly Block. Roz Mishkin shares the joy of having a washing machine as a young mother. Remember, this is the late 1940s and early 1950s. Families were just beginning to buy large home appliances. Uh, trying to think back. We lived with my in-laws at first, and then we were lucky enough to get an apartment in a two-flight walk-up which was an old Sears building on 7th Street. You <clears throat> didn't think anything of it. 7th Avenue, Frozen. Turner. Turner. It was on 7th Street, but it was between Lyndon and Turner. And they've torn that building down. Okay, it was 45 out of it. Had a little washing machine. It was, I don't know where we, everybody had to do their wash in the laundry tub mostly in those days. And we saw this small washing machine. We wanted, you wash diapers? Yeah. We, and I used it just for the, the diapers and wash them. And then as the kids out through the diapers, I started to put little things in. But it was just a little tiny tub. Oh, yeah. You know, those necessary items, you know. Everybody did. And then I remember when your in-laws, or my in-laws, got a washing machine in the basement. And my father was so proud of it. He took everybody down through the kitchen and down the probably has a step here. B color valued supporting her children in their everyday activities. I was always involved with things that involved the children when they went to Hebrew school. There were a group of us that used to make bologna sandwiches every Saturday for the kids because they attended Saturday services, a Friday night or Saturday. And um, I ran the gift shop that handled that bill for several years. Mm -hmm. And just generally, I mean, you know. Shirley Berman was the quintessential executive's wife, helping her husband forge business relationships. Um, I was involved in the sense that we socialized with a lot of his customers. And as a matter of fact, a lot of them didn't want Harry to come without me. So we always traveled together. We yes. went to Europe, we went all over together. And a lot of his business was in Europe. We're in Europe several times a year, several. And, and when you say his business was in Europe, were those his customers? Yeah, well, no. Were his he bought supplies? machines over there. Oh, mach okay. He bought machines okay. over there. Mm -hmm. And we became close friends with the people with whom we did business. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, 
we were the only customers who were invited to their homes in oh. many cases. Yes. We had wonderful times with these people. Unfortunately, all of them are dead now, every one of them. But they were wonderful people. Yes. And customers, we used to go out to California a couple times a year and meet with his people out there. He had salesmen out there and uh, also customers out there. So we, we travel out there and uh, we had good times. <laughs> <laughs> Do any, does anything stand out in your mind? Any experiences that you had well, when you we were had traveling? Wonderful conventions out in California, in Germany, in Italy, machine shows in England, all over. Yeah, these yeah. things stood out. We had just wonderful times out yeah. there with the people, with the cust with the people from whom we bought the machines, and from people who became our friends, very close friends. Tama Fogelman valued supporting the choices her children made. In this case, making them comfortable when they enrolled in Hebrew school. And then uh, we had our daughter and she was about eight or nine years old when you start religious training. And um, we thought we would join KI because it was more how we lived and how we believed. And so that's what we did. And at that time, you went to the rabbi's house, home on a Friday. It was very, very small. Um, then we um, had other children. We had two more. We had two boys, and we had another daughter. And they all chose different synagogues because that's who they were friendly with. And we felt very comfortable joining others. Also, we were part of the whole community. That's how we felt. We were friendly with different people of different beliefs in Judaism, and we were very comfortable with that. Well, the two girls ended at the Reform Synagogue. The two, the one boy uh, was bar mitzvahed at Bethel, where we had been married, and the other one at uh, Sons of Israel, the, the uh, Orthodox, because their friends were there. And so we never had to have a fuss about to go to, to services. They, they, you know, they went with their friends. We went to the different ones too. We felt very comfortable wherever we were, and we knew people in all the synagogues, and uh, it was very pleasant, very easy. Beverly Block describes why she did not want to work outside the home. She valued having the opportunity to be a stay-at-home mom. Uh, we had a babysitter, a nanny, who would say today she wasn't really, Polish girls would watch us while my mom and dad worked in the store until late in the evening. And that's the way we grew up. I actually, having been raised by a mother who was not home, I was truly adverse to, to leaving my children. I almost made a vow that I would not, <laughs> I said, not marry anyone who would demand my participation in, in the business. But of course, Lenny and I discussed everything that he did. He would come home and we would talk. When he would have a jobber come to Allentown, of course it was up to me to be sure to entertain the jobber. I remember once we actually had a jobber with his wife who came to Allentown. And New Yorkers, I don't know if this is typical, but she said, well, do you have central air conditioning? It happened to have been summer. <laughs> and I said, yes, and I made him clean offhanded joke by saying yes, but the plumbing is outside. <laughs> well, there was one very funny, uh, every Christmas, uh, many would give up, we would have a Christmas party. And we were not large enough or economically feasible enough to go and rent a hall. So we would have a party in the factory itself. Many would order cold. My specialty was making jello molds. <laughs> and I remember taking, I didn't have a car, I took a taxi with my jello mold down to the, to 6th Street, and on the way the mold started to melt. And this poor taxi driver, a uh, mold <laughs> melted all over his car, his cab. <laughs> well, that was one of the really highlights of my helping out with the Christmas party. <laughs> Other than that, we just a sounding board. I tried to be a sounding board for whatever my husband had to talk about. 
I admired and respected my husband tremendously. Uh, to be a person without a college education, which most of his friends, when we were 20 and had a child, his friends came to visit and they were second year college students. I mean, they looked at us and thought, and then I admired him tremendously for another reason. Um, our daughter is disabled. She was born disabled. And he became not only my helpmate, but I could not have actually gotten through the years that we had with hospitals and physical therapy and everything that goes with raising a disabled child without having this wonderful help me. He was strong, courageous, was at my side for everything. The Jewish community always had a very well-established network of communal institutions. In addition to synagogues, there are institutions that promote and preserve culture, support Israel, assist the needy, educate the community, and engage the youth. Common to all of these institutions is that to carry out their respective missions, they rely on people to freely donate their time, volunteers, talent, leadership, specialized skills, and dollars. The women who are profiled in these next clips were community leaders who spoke passionately about their role as community leaders and the personal rewards they derived from being community leaders. The women profiled in these next clips are Claire Selitsky, Marilyn Bronstein, and Ronnie Sheftel. Claire talks about how her parents taught her to be generous and give to others. Claire shares the story of her mother paying bills for others in the community who were less fortunate. And to them, education was important and service to the community. That was one thing I learned growing up in Alabama. You, you can't just take, you must give back. You must be a part of your community, and if you are more fortunate, you are to help others. All I know is, when she went to Florida, she said to me, I'm leaving you signed checks for Freeman's Dairy. I said, for what? She said, well, she said, I pay for milk for people. And so I want you, you know, pay the bill. I said, all right. But you know, this went on year after year after year. And one day, I walked, I was then already involved with the Federation, and I, I asked George Felton, who well, then it was called UJA, I asked him, the executive director of the center and nothing, UJA, I said, I, I have to ask yourself, Mr. Felton, my mother is buying milk for all these people. I said, do you know, do they still have little children? And he looked at me and he said, no. He said, really, I should tell Mary to stop. So I said, well, I'm going to tell Mary. I'm not. Do you know she got mad at me? And she said, you will continue, and I will continue while I'm alive. If they don't need them, maybe their children need them. Marilyn talks about her work with Hadassah, a women's Zionist organization. You can hear the passion in her voice as she recounts some of her experiences. At the end of the clip, you will see a picture of the current and former Hadassah presidents at that time. Marilyn is the blonde, second from the top. And then I got, became very active in, in Hadassah. Hadassah taught me to be a Jew. Um, they taught me how to be as philanthropic as I could, because they always had quotas that we had to make and send money into to national. That was very important. I wasn't very involved with Hadassah. I, was, I did a lot of things. I collected blue boxes. I went door to door to, to get the pushkas. And 
And it was very pleasant. And that was one of the jobs, one of the poor jobs. Try and find somebody to do that today. Anyway, um, I, so I, I stayed with Hadassah. I got on the board and did many, many jobs. It was like stepping up and training me to be. I never expected to be asked to be president. And, and my best friend said when they had the nomination committee meeting that I wouldn't, I wouldn't take it if they asked me. They were sure I would say no. So um, I said yes. And that was 1970. It's a two-year term, 1972. That was the, my year, the year of my first trip to Israel. And that's what meant everything to me. My best friends were also involved with Hadassah. And we worked together on projects. We used to sit and cut out invitations. We, we cooked in the kitchen. Um, it was very close to my heart, and I and I loved being able to contribute to Hadassah. Ronnie Sheftel shares with us about her leadership role in various nonprofit organizations. Once again, we hear from a former Hadassah president about the dominance of Hadassah in the Lehigh Valley from the 1950s through the 1980s. I was included in, I think, three or four boards, something I had never done before. And uh, my first experience was being to collect uh, raffle, sell raffle tickets to a dinner dance at Temple Bethel. And as time came closer, of course, I had to go away with my husband. When he said, let's go, I went. And coming back, I had given it to a friend of mine to collect. And uh, I came back and got to find out how the dinner dance went and how we did with the uh, collection. And I found out that half the people that were there had gotten so many poisoning because whoever had cooked the dinner had left it out too long. And it was very sensitive and nobody was talking about the dinner. So I had never knew if the t tickets were ever sold. Uh, as far as the big deals in my life, I was, uh, one year I was chairman for the uh, Federation, Jewish Federation of, Val of Lehigh Valley. Um, and uh, we raised a lot of money for the women's division. There was a lot of money at that time. And then shortly after that, I became president of, very proudly, of Hadassah, which at the time I became president in 1980, there were 700 members. And it was a wonderful organization. And at that time, I think we raised over $50,000, which was enormous. And I sat down and realized, well, I'm now ahead of a $50,000 business, which I guess in 1980s was pretty good. And we did very well. The next lens is labeled women with careers. But of course, women usually had jobs in the second shift of home and family as well. Each woman shares her enthusiasm for her specific and chosen vocation. The women featured in this category are Judy Miller, Bunny Filler, Ellen Schneider, Maxine Klein, and Marlene Finkelstein. 
Judy Miller talks about operating her outlet store at the garment factory her family ran. And it was a hole in the wall. In the factory in building? In the factory building on the ground floor. It's a true outlet. Yes, it's a yes, true it outlet. Was. Yeah. And I sold ribbons, laces, because these were all leftover rolls from the, fa from the lingerie uh, business. And ends of piece goods, I had rolls of piece goods. I froze in that building because it wasn't heated. I had a, a space heater. I did have a telephone. Right? I didn't make a lot of money, and I was open only three yeah, days a two, week, two days a week. Right? And I had a lot of customers, people would come in. Oh, you know what? You never told them you were a contractor for a Christian Dior. I know. Yeah. So I mentioned contractor, but yeah, I know. right. Yeah, right. right. Uh, so I had some of their leftover things that I sold. So I that was when I met the woman who said she wrote our elevator in the factory because her mm. friend's father owned the silk mill when it was a silk mill. Anyhow, um, and then I sold whatever were, were extras. Yes. Well, we were a very close involved community. Yeah, yeah. So uh, back to my business. Uh, people would come in for laces. They were making confirmation dresses and wedding gowns and whatever. And I would sell it by the yard and measure it out. I mean, it was so basic. Oh, that's the other thing. My tables were, were made. My father-in-law was the king of repossessing repossess, doors and the doors oh. and <laughs> the tables. That's great. Bunny Filler discusses her rewarding career as a teacher and music program director in the local Jewish community. And then I went to Boston University and I became an early childhood, I was an early childhood major and I taught kindergarten in New York for five years. And then my Prince Charlie came and helped me. And we got married and we came to, he helped me find a job here. He called places for me because I was still in New York. And I got a job in, Allen, in the Allentown School District. Otis Rothenberg had interviewed me and he wanted to give me a first grade position and I looked at him square in the eyes. I don't know how I got the nerve and I said, I'm going to be a brand new bride. I don't know a soul in Allentown. I don't know anything, but I am a wonderful kindergarten teacher and I've been doing it for years. I really don't want something new. He went and looked up something. He said, fine, you can teach kindergarten at Lehigh Parkway. And then about two years later, I went over to the center. They did not have a music program for their three-year-olds. And I said, I'll do it for free. I'll just sit and play songs to them. And so, Fine, they hired me. What could be better? I didn't know yeah. me anything. And I've been working for nothing ever since because then I went to the day school and they don't pay to work. <laughs> but in any event, I stayed at the center for a long time. And then somebody approached me at the day school and asked me if I would do the music program. And this is someone who does not read Hebrew or speak Hebrew. But I taught a lot of Jewish music. They didn't learn it. It's mm -hmm. not difficult. And then while I was there, the principal, Barry Cohn, asked me if I would begin a pre-kindergarten program and they never had one. And I said, I, I could try. And so I started there in 1980, I want to say 83 or 84, something like that. And I started that PK program that's there now. I was there for 27 years. And then I loved, 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 loved working there. Ellen Schneider shares how she returned to finish college after her children got older. Then she went on to have a rewarding career working with seniors at the Jewish Community Center. Uh, late 60s, early 70s. And uh, I served on the board of the Jewish Community Center for 15 years. And then uh, after I had finished uh, I interrupted ed education and got a degree in social work. Uh, actually, I was placed with the Jewish Family Service as part of some of my uh, courts work. And 
an opening. They said to me, go down to the friendship circle and interact. I didn't know what that was, but I figured I'll figure it out. And I went down there and uh, interacted. And after a few months, an opening occurred. And the director of the center came to me and said, would you like to come and work here? I said, Lenny, I haven't finished my course yet. He said, take some extra courses finishing up and start work here. So I actually started the job while I was still finishing up my course work. And, uh, I would have to say that the years that I spent working with the elderly, I discovered I had a rapport with elderly that I never knew that I had. When I started uh, taking social work, and intended to do work in the field, I thought I would work with children. And just happenstance got me working with the elderly and discovered that I like them. Now I'm one of them. <laughs> Maxine Klein discusses her career path, first as an oncology nurse, and later as a nurse practitioner with Planned Parenthood. I always felt that I wanted to be more than Mrs. So-and-so. Uh, growing up at the time that I did, uh, the first half of my life, uh, we were programmed into the old ways of becoming secretaries or teachers or nurses, and but ma mainly wives and mothers. And then the women's movement happened in the middle of that, and all of a sudden, women were supposed to be more than that. Um, at first, I resisted this, but then I decided that I thought I would like to be more than that too and have my own identity. A close friend of mine um, arranged for me to interview with one of the local oncologists who was looking for a nurse to come in and give his patients what he couldn't do. Uh, education, time, uh, contact with family, uh, help to understand what the patient uh, uh, needed about their treatment, about the, the uh, uh, disease, etc. So I went and interviewed, and he hired me. It was David Prager, who was a wonderful oncologist and is now deceased. Um, and I worked for him and his um, partners for seven years uh, as an oncology nurse. I became an oncology nurse specialist, um, and I helped design patient education, um, as well as um, some courses for visiting nurses to come through to learn how to do some certain techniques. and. It was very exciting. Very, for me, it was very, very exciting. There was a special program with Planned Parenthood and the University of Pennsylvania and the United States government to try to get clinicians into uh, places where, that served the underserved. So it was a speed up kind of thing. And I could become an, a women's health nurse practitioner in one, one year's time, <clears throat> which would give me a certificate, not a master's degree, and I didn't need anything other than my associate degree and my RA license. So I, so I thought, okay, everything, nothing else is happening right now. A year will go by and either I will be a nurse practitioner or I won't. So I said, yes, I'll do it. And then I worked for 12 years. At the time that I did it, I thought, how long am I really gonna work? You know, I mean, well, if I work two years, it'll make it worthwhile, but I worked 12. And it was most exciting and most gratifying and, um, it kept me young, kept me in touch with all different ages of, of people and what was happening. And I could do a lot of teaching in a really short amount of time to a patient population that really, really wanted that teaching. Marlene Finkelstein talks about her passion from a young age to be a counselor and social worker. I knew I wanted to be a psychologist, therapist, counselor, whatever, when I was probably about six years old. But my, my, um, I didn't even know the name for it, but I was sort of fascinated by that. Um, but uh, that's, I got my MSW and um, I had interned at Quakertown Hospital in the psychiatric unit as part of the program. And I stayed on there and uh, worked inpatient psych for another 10 years. And uh, 
and it was with a group called the Alliance for Creative Development. We were psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, and creative therapists. It was a wonderful program it was before managed care and all that stuff. And um, where we really could work with patients as a team and see results. It was a, a very, very exciting time. And uh, they, the Alliance for Creative Development had um, the hospital unit and we had uh, inpatient uh, offices as well. So I started a private, outpatient offices. I mean, so I started a private practice with them also. And um, 25 years later, I retired. So, you know, starting some institutions that, that are still going um, has, has been a very creative process. And being a therapist, I, I love being a therapist, and I, I, I do miss it. And Finally, here is the category, Women as Entrepreneurs. Remember, this is at a time when it was quite uncommon for women to be entrepreneurs. The women featured in this last segment of our talk are Dolores Dellin, Goldie Hartzell, and Esther Halperin. Dolores Dellin shares a story about her grandmother instilling in her the importance of being resilient and independent, two important traits of a successful entrepreneur. Later, Dolores owned an upscale women's clothing store in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. I, I, as I said, my grandma and I were very close, and we were. And when I got married, she pulled me aside and she said, look, Dolores, every woman should have her own knipple. And by that, she meant that every woman should have her own money. And so with that, she gave me a $100 bill. And she put it away. All doesn't have to know about it. Whether you want anything. Now you're thinking back. I'm married 65 years. Right. A hundred dollars was a lot of money. Right. So I put it away and didn't say anything to my aunt about it. And we went on a honeymoon. And we went to Niagara Falls. And we were traveling around. And at the falls, all the losers, all our money, all our travelers' checks, and everything was in travelers' checks, and he doesn't have anything. And he found out when he <coughs> paid the bill. He wanted to stay at this fancy hotel, and he goes to pay the bill, and he doesn't have any money. And you know, credit cards in those days, the travelers' checks, that was it. He didn't know what to do, he was frustrated. I said, don't worry about it. I turned around and I pulled out this $100 bill. And ever since then, he's been looking for the knipple. <laughs> and there is one. <laughs> and I tell my son to have one, I tell my daughter to have one. My daughter's not married. But in, in any young woman, I always say, it's very important for every person to have a little, in, man or woman, should have a little independence, a little money put aside that you don't have to account to anybody for it. And that was my grandmother's philosophy. Goldie Hartzell. This is the only clip in this presentation that is not in the first person. Goldie's story is included because for the Hartzell family, it was a woman's vision and a woman's skills that pushed the family into owning a business. The mother's name was Goldie. And she had worked in the factory when I was in high school. That, that she eventually became a Ford lady in that same factory and part owner of it. Uh, what do you mean? Part, they made children's clothing. Okay. And in 1962, my mother and myself decided to go in business. We knew enough about the business as a whole to get into our own business and, and, and run it. So we decided to go into business, her and I. Uh, we started with. 12 sewing machines, rent it out of the factory, I remortgaged my house, and that's how we started in business. It's just, my mother was business smart kid also. You know? Yes. And uh, between us, you know, I had the other aspects of it, the cutting and the shipping and everything. Yeah. And I began to set piece rates and do one thing at a time, more and more, we I came involved in the business. Yeah. And finally, we are profiling Esther Halpern, who was a reluctant entrepreneur. When she suddenly became a young widow, 
she was faced with the challenge of how to support her 10-year-old, six-month-old, and herself. Esther recognized quickly that she could not support her family as a nursery school teacher, so she decided to run her husband's factory, even though she had no prior experience in the business. To Esther's surprise, she became a creative, smart, successful business owner for 30 years. I was now had a 12 year old and, and a new baby, Jonathan. Um, and I, I didn't see myself, how do I go back to teaching public school and leaving two children now? Although I knew not a thing about the garment industry, I said, I see other people in this industry with less uh, talent than I have. So maybe I can make it. Um, but I became very successful there. I guess fresh eyes and uh, I had a lot of obstacles, but I overcame them. I would have on their machines automatic cutters that would cut the thread instead of them picking up a scissor right. and having to cut it. And right. then, you know, I, I really study the whole thing and I decided where I could make us, how I could make a success of this. In fact, I produced more out of my factory with X amount of girls than most factories in the area did. I must admit that probably because I was a novice and didn't do things the way they were always done, right. that I was successful in this business. And it wasn't easy. They didn't like having a woman boss in the beginning. <laughs> right. But, you know, I, I made very good friends with them. I was their financier, and, you know, when they needed money, I would give them loan money. And, but I had a lot of empathy for them. Right. I really felt pretty horrible because I felt their work was dehumanizing. And I, they sat there like a robot all day long and did the same thing, did the same operation, and it was hard work. Absolutely. And uh, I was sensitive to that, and I tried not to be an exploiter. <laughs> I did everything I could to make life as easy for them. I air conditioned the place. I put in a, um, a system that would, um, clean the air so they weren't breathing all the uh, the dust and the lint from so I I did the best to make their workplace comfortable and healthy I did and I did empathize with the fact that that was the only way they could make a living I did thank you to the many families who were interviewed for this project they generously shared their time and stories. Thank you to the sponsors of the project. And finally, thank you to Muhlenberg College. So that is uh, the presentation. Um, before I show you the site, does anybody have any questions, any comments, anything that anybody wants to know more about, or Carol? Um, first of all, as a former colleague, also retired from the old work, um, I want to express my deepest gratitude and congratulations to you and Susan for doing really valuable So uh, I really have two questions. Um, the first kind of relates to the, the methodology and your experience. Because doing oral history um, is something that one can learn, but you can have principles and then you learn on the job. So I, I'm curious to know over time how you found yourself changing 
in your approach to the interviews, um, just just your, your methodology right. and your your personal growth. Right, 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 right. Well, thank you, for, thank you for for your comments and thank you for that question. And one thing that we very much did is <clears throat> when we started this. We didn't envision that we'd ever be that anybody would ever be watching videos. We thought we were just going to be writing some articles from it. But then what happened is the technology kept improving, and everything is now digital and videos and things of that nature. So, in the beginning, when we were interviewing, we were talking a lot more. The last few years, as we started having videos and realizing that this is something that we're going to be able to show people is we started talking a lot less and we started having the interview take place in as long as they were mobile enough in our in an office so 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 some of the ones that are later or you can even see that the people are sitting in the office and frankly our um, all of our technology worked better so so one that was a major change for us <clears throat> and and then in in general um, you're, you're right that over time, frankly, it was even more of a learning curve for me because um, my partner, Susan Clemens, her background is doing oral histories. My background is doing um, in-depth interviewing because of my marketing research background and statistical analysis and whatever. And so, um, so again, for me, it was a little bit more of a learning curve, and um, but we became you know, you become more and more comfortable. And I must say, for the most part, the people themselves were, were very good at sharing their stories. Um, initially, I remember thinking, will people share their stories? But you know, then I realized all of the people we dealt with, as you can see, were, many of them were elderly. And not, when do, you know, a lot of times no one asked them, to just share their stories. And I think for the most part, they were really happy to share their story and to really re-engage and rethink and relive a lot of these times. I think another thing is what I think is so um, beautiful about oral histories is otherwise, history is just of the very top people. So we all know about Levi genes, you know, a little bit, or we know about Burlington, you know, the really major um, manufacturers. But rarely do you know about small businesses. That, that's one thing that now is there's more and more of these oral histories. It's an opportunity to really give everybody's, get everybody's voice, not just at the highest, not just at the highest levels in society. And that's what I think is really interesting about this. This, let me tell you where this question comes from. I am currently, and have been actually for quite a while, researching uh, a fiber artist. Her name is Mildred Johnstone, and uh, she was the ex uh, wife of, the exec of a senior executive of Bethlehem Steel. And a lot of the time that she and her husband were there, overlaps with some of your so like the right. 40s and 50s sure. and so forth. So um, what I was wondering, uh, because I mean Bethlehem Steel is such a different kind of entity um, from some of these textile mills and so forth with an incredible variety of, of activities. Um, and as I think of the philanthropic work that I've read about, Mildred Johnstone's existence, and I think of Bethlehem Steel, which is, you know, this very different kind of organization, and the um, board certainly predominantly Christian, and then I think about, you know, some of these folks um, in the textile mills at the management level, um, and I'm wondering to what extent and in what ways might there have been some kind of interaction 
think there was much. I mean, Bethlehem Steel was large, right? Here, when you're talking about the man, it was, it was maybe three people. Um, and so I, I'm not sure that there was that way. Now, I assume it was obvious, most of the people in here, not all of them, but most of the people you saw were Jewish, right? Um, that's in part because that's a little bit who I had access to. Um, <clears throat> however, as we were doing this, one thing that I thought was very interesting is of these businesses, there was definitely a lot of Jewish families and a lot of Italian families. Um, as you can, I did not get though to interview the Italian families. They were much more in the Poconos area. Down here in the Lehigh Valley, it was a lot of Jewish families. And I think in both cultures, there's a lot of entrepreneurialism. And these were businesses that we talk about in economics as easy entry. In other words, to go into a Bethlehem Steel, you've got to have millions and millions of dollars. Here to get started, they had to have a couple of sewing machines. You know, some of them talked about $500 loan, a couple of sewing machines, got one contract, and they got started. Now, those who were not successful, we didn't get to, went out of business and we never interviewed. But then some of them who were entrepreneurial, lucky with timing, um, whatever, it became more successful businesses, but these were really businesses that were easy to get into. And so those tend to get the immigrant population as opposed to others that, you know, something like the steel, at that point, it's, it's very hard to get into that kind of very, very, um, uh, you know, without tremendous capital and technology and things of that nature. Yes? But I think the labor force is very related because yes. obviously the reason there are all these women who are available for low wage textile work you're is right. the steel mill wasn't you're right. hiring women at all. So. Yes, yes, you're right. And not only that, these were often the wives. So these were wives of often men who were working, whether it was in steel or certain other businesses. You're, you're absolutely correct. Good point. Any any other questions? Um, for those who might be interested, I will show you the site, what the site looks like. Okay. Um, I think I need just assistance to get to the site. So this is just one. It's a safety thing. Okay. So, so just this is the site. This is the site. And um, Andrea said that they're going to put this on the website that you can have a link to it. Um, you can find this by doing a, a, a Google search or whatever. But you can see the different tabs here. So this is information about the project itself, and it has, um, <laughs> yeah, you know what, do you want to just scroll down the wall? Thank you. So here's an introduction, and you can see this talks, a lot of these things I included, but this talks about various aspects of the project itself. And then going, Then here, if you go to the second tab, this brings you, this gives you the individual interviews. So here's all of the interviews, a description of it. If you click on them, you get to watch the entire interview. And there's a transcript, chapter listings. And so you're able to, because some of the interviews are long, right? You're able to see different um, parts to it. One is a scroll to the top. <coughs> And then here under public presentations, that's where we were with this. And so this is the one, the first one is the American Dream Story. That's the one on the businesses themselves. Then the second one, this was the one that we watched. And then there's um, one that's just PowerPoint presentation and one that's a, an article that was written about. And I'm um, and thank you for 
sitting, sitting through this and having a little bit to learn about uh, this particular topic. Thank you again, Gail. I had a, a wonderful introduction to her work with Susan's work through a fellow colleague, Susan Falciani Maldonado at uh, Muhlenberg. So it was really great to connect with you to learn more about this, and this was wonderful. So thank you so much for sharing with us. And um, just to let you know that we have a couple of upcoming programs. We have um, <clears throat> every third Sunday of the month, we have family uh, fun, STEAM adventures. So the uh, Free Family Sundays programs. We also have a lecture upcoming April 27th, Bethlehem Steel and the Lincoln Tunnel, the Bethlehem Plant Iron Foundry and its role in tunnel history with Trevor Shellhammer, who was a, he's part of the Foundry Men, also a former Bethlehem Steel research and uh, iron specialist. So that'll be also really interesting. And then please put June 10th and 11th on your calendar. 1876, we're going to have World's Fair weekend. So it's going to be a really fun weekend here of, with lots of different demonstrations, talks, and learning more about 1876 and America's debut on the world stage. So thank you again for joining us today.